May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Today's gospel story is the story of Jesus having a change of heart and admitting he made a mistake. He is going about the countryside at this point in his ministry. He has already become famous for the acts of healing and mercy, for his incredible words, which are liberating people throughout the region. And a woman comes to him. The author of the Gospel of Mark identifies her simply by the word Syrophoenician, a term which means that she is from the region north of the current Holy Land. It says that she is a Gentile, i.e. not of the same religion as Jesus. She is not Jewish. She comes to him with an urgent request. Her daughter needs help. She is sick. And instead of offering his gentle and kind responses, which he does to almost everyone who comes to him in search of help, Jesus insults her. He compares her and her daughter to dogs. She has a witty retort, however, and she responds that even the dogs gather up the crumbs from underneath the table. And it's in that moment that Jesus has his change of heart. He changes his mind and says, for saying that, your daughter has been made well. You can contrast this story with the one that immediately follows it. Jesus travels a little bit further, and there is a, a deaf man with a speech impediment, and Jesus simply heals him. There's no dialogue, no back and forth, no test, no need for this man to prove his faith. Now, commentators throughout the ages have pointed to the story of the Syrophoenician woman as an example of how everyone can have faith in Jesus, even people who might never have heard of him before or who aren't a part of our Christian faith. But I hear this story very differently. I hear this story as a story not so much about this unnamed woman as about Jesus himself. Jesus understands that he got it wrong. Why would he respond to someone who is in such obvious distress with such a sharp tongue? Why would he have to interact in this woman in this way that is probably even more distressing than when she was when she originally came to him? Jesus realizes the error of his ways. And right away, he turns around and makes it better. He heals the daughter. And even though he doesn't go quite as far as to apologize to this woman, which he probably should have, at the very least, he admits that he has made a mistake. I wonder if this story is less about the faith of the Syrophoenician woman than the faith of Jesus and a God that loves everyone even people to whom he himself might be prejudiced. The lesson that we have to take away from the story of the Syrophoenician woman is that even Jesus makes mistakes. And if even Jesus makes mistakes, then his followers are even more likely to make mistakes. Christianity is by absolutely no means perfect. As we learn from the story today, even Jesus wasn't perfect. Jesus, the one whom we proclaim to be savior of the world, the one whom we proclaim to be God from God, light from light, true God from true God, this person, this savior, made a mistake. And what did he do when he made his mistake? Well, he made it right, right away. He didn't dig in his heels. 
He didn't try to defend his position against all odds. He didn't proclaim his infallibility before all people. No. With humility, he turned around and made it right. He did the right thing. This is certainly a lesson for us all. It's a lesson for us personally, of course, about how to deal with our own failings in the world. Being a Christian does not mean being perfect, certainly not by any stretch of the imagination. None of us is made perfect. And a faith structure that assumes that we are all perfect in our dealings and our decisions is simply a fantasy. A true faith, a deep faith, acknowledges our failings and our mistakes. And it gives us a framework for what to do when we screw up. The answer here is pretty clear. If you've insulted someone, if you've neglected someone, if you've made the wrong choice, simply make it better. Say, I'm sorry. Try to repair the damage. And if you can't, at least let the person know that you want to. But even more deeply than our individual actions, this story tells us something about Christianity in general as a religion. You see, Christianity is a very, very strange religion. Because deep down, in the very DNA of this religion, is a deep suspicion of religion. This savior whom we follow and proclaim is flawed in some ways, even to the point where he has to admit he has made a mistake. The gospel is rife with stories of religion gone wrong. Think of Jesus in the temple court overturning the tables of the money changers. Think of the priests who were the ones who delivered him to his own death. Think of the apostle Peter, the rock on whom the church is built, denying Jesus three times the morning of his betrayal and crucifixion. The gospel does not give us an outline for how to do church. It doesn't tell us when to have our festivals, or how to engage in our liturgy. The gospel gives us very few clues about how to do religion, because it itself is skeptical of religion. What the gospel does instead is something miraculous. It tells us to love God. It tells us to love our neighbor as ourselves. It gives us Jesus, whom it proclaims will be with us throughout all time. This strange, enchanting, even somewhat flawed Jesus, who will be by our side. Everything else is just the religion that we have built on top of these stories, of these principles, of these ideas, of this Jesus. And that everything else is, according to the very principles of this religion, bound to make mistakes. And that is what makes Christianity such a strange and odd religion. Now this idea that, that our very religion is itself skeptical of religion, that our religion understands from its very foundations that it is flawed, can be very distressing to people. We want certainty. We want clarity. We want a set of rules, and we want to know that those rules are bound for all time. But unfortunately, we are not offered such clarity. We are not offered such certainty. We are not given a promise that this religion will tell us everything that we have to do and we'll get it right all the time. Actually, it's quite the opposite. Instead, we are given certainty that this religion is a human response to an experience of the divine. And because it's composed of human beings, it will forever have blemishes and flaws encoded into it. 
And so the only thing we can do, if we truly believe that we are following Jesus, is, that, is to acknowledge when we stumble and mess things up, to apologize, and to try to make it right. Personally, I think this is a healthy way of going about things. It's difficult, because it's hard to admit that you're wrong. But really, it's the only way to be faithful to this gospel message that we claim to be the stewards of. Now, to be honest, when I look around and I hear the messages that are the ones that are the loudest ones breaking through from Christians about what's going on in our society today, I hear a lot more mistakes than I do good things. We all know about the churches that were trying to defy the mask orders at the beginning of the, uh, the, beginning of the pandemic. We've all heard about the preachers who are preaching against vaccines for some reason. We've all heard about the churches that have sued the government to try to gather even when it was incredibly dangerous to have mass gatherings. The loudest voices from churches have not been on the right side of this, the most important thing that has happened in our society in the last 18 months. And it really doesn't end there. Because when we hear Christian voices breaking through, more often than not, they're not preaching about the things that Jesus clearly would have been most concerned about if he were here in the world today. We don't hear Christian voices talking about the fact that we are destroying our planet, that we will make it uninhabitable for future generations. We don't hear Christian voices out in the street decrying poverty, both in this country and around the world. We don't hear Christian voices calling for a complete overhaul of our corrupt criminal justice system that is destroying so many lives, imprisoning two million Americans for no particular reason. These are clearly the things that Jesus would have cared about, and not just because they're things that I personally care about. And yet, when we do hear these Christian voices, they seem to speak with such certainty that it's almost impossible to believe that they could ever admit that they might be making a mistake of some kind. Well, what I'm saying to you this morning is that if even Jesus could make a mistake, and if even Jesus could turn around and try to make that mistake better, well, then Christians should be able to, too. We start practicing in our own lives by admitting our mistakes and trying to make amends. And then as a community, as an assembly, we can do the same. We preach the tr truth and proclaim the gospel in love. And on those occasions when we realize that we have gotten it wrong, well, then we offer words of humility and apology. And that's just the way it should be. Very famously, there is a very famous uh, 20th century theologian named Paul Tillich, who said that the opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is certainty. This is one of the favorite quotations of preachers and churches like this one. And I think he's onto something, although personally I'm not entirely, entirely convinced that the opposite of faith is certainty. But I will tell you this. The opposite of certainty is not faith. The opposite of certainty is humility. Walking the Christian road requires humility. And humility is something that doesn't feel very good when you're not used to practicing it. That's one of the reasons we come here, week after week, in person or online, assembling here in this beautiful building or watching the images at home. We do it to learn what it means to be humble, to admit our mistakes, to admit that we are fallible human beings, and discover the freedom that comes 
with not always trying to be perfect, with not always trying to go through life believing that you are certain about everything that is going on, and instead to hand yourself over to this mysterious, loving, all-powerful God whom we confess at all times. Friends, as we walk through this life in love, we must do it with humility. We must do it recognizing our own faults and our own mistakes. And we must do it not only for the sake of those whom we harm, but for the sake of our own souls, so that we can be right with ourselves and with our God. That's what Jesus did. And that's what we can do too. Amen.